microphone check. One, two, the microphone check. One, two, one, two, the microphone check. I got my headphones tuned between two different AM stations and my briefcase is full of declassified information. Declassified, uh huh, mm -hmm. declassified. Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for the 32nd week of 2016. I'm Carl Estabrook. Since the summer of 1990, this program has been a weekly hour of spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion, of the news of the week, and its coverage by the media. First on a so-called community radio station, and now via Urbana Public Television and YouTube. Our program's name, News from Neptune, comes from Noam Chomsky who's been writing sensible things about U.S. politics for more than half a century. Chomsky says that in the U.S. media, either you repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true, and it will sound like it's from Neptune. Tonight, David Green, Ron Zoke, and I will try to say some true things. It's August 12th, and we've begun the practice here at News from Neptune of beginning the show with a bit of imaginative literature before launching into the week's register of the crimes, follies, and misfortunes of humankind, as Edward Gibbon described history. Two weeks ago, we began with Elizabeth Appleby's confessional poem, The Disfiguring of America. Last week, it was Jeffrey Sinclair's Beckettian satire of the Sanders campaign, Bernie's Last Tape. And this week, we have a piece, thanks to Mr. Green here, uh, a, you describe it as a poem from your non Nigerian fr friend in L.A.? Yes. Uh, I've known this woman since I met her when I was 14 years old in 1964. Uh -huh. uh, her son was and still is one of my best friends all of these years. And she is a 95-year-old woman who lives in, San in Santa Monica, California. Peggy Aylesworth is her, pen is her pen name and also her birth name, although she has a different married name. She publishes under the name Peggy Aylesworth, A-Y-L-S. That word Ailes is sticking, uh, <laughs> is not going down very well this week, so to speak. But, um, but uh, anyway, Peggy, uh, at the age of 95, and after surviving many bouts with, with, with uh, death, um, is going strong, at least, at least poetically. She writes a poem every morning, and every Thursday she sends it out to her email list and she's very much in touch with her as as we might say poetic un, 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 unconscious I, I mean the poems these poems appear to her every day and ver are very much about who she is and with that I would I would invite you to to read it Carl called participation no matter how late I eat my breakfast the screeching headlines bloody crimes, gross injustice, etc., dump their grievances in my tea. My English muffin tastes of tart calamity. The world refuses to repair. Grateful as I am for the embroidered intimacy my life provides, I can't dismiss complicity. It does no good to wallow in self-castigation. But what finger can I raise, what generosity extend, beyond the holy circle of my little world. That's Peggy Aylesworth's verse, Participation. And you're watching News from Neptune, a participation edition. Uh, David, are you <laughs> going to be the first to participate? Yes, I am. And I hope this doesn't go on too long, but <laughs> I've got, I've bitten off uh, maybe a bit much to chew here, but I feel like I need, to, I'm, I'm impressed with the recent writing of Adolf Reed on oh, yeah. the Jacobin website. And they, one is an interview about Bernie Sanders, which I'm regarding, regarding the issue of Bernie Sanders, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna read some excerpts from. The other that I would commend to you is an article about Atlantic City and Donald Trump's dealings in Atlantic City over the years because you know, and Carl, I mean, I have to be honest in saying I know, and it's it's clear that, that Trump has proposed some views that oppose primary aspects of the of the ne neoliberal agenda. Right. But I think that some of what Adolf Reed is writing should bring us back to earth in terms of understanding that he's operated within this neoliberal context and been quite successful, especially promoting himself, obviously, 
in this neoliberal context. But let's just leave that for a while. And let's go back to talking about Bernie. And this, I think, uh, as fun as it is for Jeffrey Sinclair to write long poems about, long tragic poems about Bernie sitting on a park bench, um, I think Adolf Reed has some important things to say about the Sanders campaign. He was asked, some say that we have to understand Sanders' defeat as a result of his lack of interest in racism and sexism. Angela Davis wrote that S Sanders was a candidate who was reluctant to, to re reluctant to address racism, quote unquote, and who engaged in a kind of economic reductionism that prevents him from developing a vocabulary that allows him to speak in ways that enlighten us about the persistence of racist violence and state violence. That's what Angela Davis said. And then to end this question of Adolf Reed, the, the questioner states, Paul Krugman argued that he was unable to address horizontal inequality, quote unquote, oh, and therefore geez. to win the minority vote. And then Adolf Reed is asked in conclusion, what do you think of those critics? And Adolf Reed responds, in a way, it's difficult to respond to such charges because they have no concrete content. Mm -hmm. All through the campaign, I asked how a federal minimum wage of $15 an hour, the current minimum wage is $7.25, is not an issue pertinent to black, black, black Americans and, and Latinos who are disproportionately likely to be low-wage workers. How decommodified national health care is not a black issue, or free public higher education, or massively increased pub public, public investment, or re renegotiating existing trade agreements and blocking the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would further strengthen corporate power uh, against all working people, and so and so on. No one has argued that black or other non-white Americans, indeed, would not benefit disproportionately from implementation of those as items of Sanders' platform. By contrast, what does it mean to address racism? No one in American politics with any aspirations to respectability op open, openly embraces racism, not even Donald Trump. In fact, everyone, even Trump, insists that he or she opposes it. How is it economic reductionism to campaign on a program that seeks to unite the broad working class around concerns shared throughout the class across race, gender, and other lines? Ironically, in American politics, we now have a left for which any reference to political economy can be castigated as economic reductionism, quote unquote. It's immensely revealing, uh, Adolf Reed goes on, and it, and, and exposing this is one contribution the campaign made that I never, never, that that I never anticipated. That we now have a left, quote unquote, in the United States for which socialism is considered a matter of backwardness. <laughs> it's good that 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 is now clear. It's always good to know where people stand in relation to class struggle. Mm -hmm. I found Krugman's claim to be especially interesting, as I did Clinton's complain that breaking up the big banks wouldn't yeah. end s racism or sexism. It wouldn't end solar storms <laughs> or, help or, or help Bahrain win the World Cup either. Krugman follows a, sim a familiar line in the constitution of post-war liberalism that disconnects the idea of inequality from political economy and renders it exclusively as group dis group disparity and of course all of these all of these comments play into the notion of the relation between class struggle and political economy and what we we call identity politics um, and then Reed is asked what seemed interesting and this is this very brief excerpts from a, a, a long a long interview that can be found on the Jacobin website I think by now it might be on the second page of that of the blog on that website. The question, what seemed interesting to me was the ability of Sanders to connect his campaign with broader labor movements in the United States, from the $15 minimum wage to his support for the for the Verizon strike, he seemed always very concerned with creating a positive dynamic between labor activists and his campaign. Is this the strategy we consider we should consider for the future of the US left? And Adolph Reed responds, yes. I think it's axiomatic that in the United States or elsewhere, as elsewhere, that if there's no firm grounding in the labor movement, there's no really serious left. A lot of people don't like to hear that, but I, I think those are mainly people who prefer their, their emotionally fulfilling fantasies 
to p pursuit of political power, uh, they they prefer their 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 you know emotionally fulfilling fantasies rather than pursuing political power as an objective for building socialism. It and it Reed goes on. It seems to me in the end that the total that the real that the really neoliberal candidate is Clinton and not Trump. In many sure. ways, both Bernie and Trump voters voted against everything Clinton stands for. On Bernie's side, against right. free trade, equal opportunity, rather than equality, free markets, and 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 aggressive foreign policy, a pro pro Wall Street position were central issues of contention. But on the other side, Trump, in his very demagogic way, also did express himself against the free trade deals. Clinton's foreign policy and, and also and also immigration as a threat to wages and jobs. And I think as, as someone as left as left as Paul Street has acknowledged that it's important to understand understand that that among the working class, immigration is an issue relating to jobs, not just to racism. Yes, exactly. So to a certain extent, and then uh, uh, Reed goes on in his response. To a, so to a certain extent, this debate is not only about Democrats versus Republicans, but also about neoliberalism and its effects. It seems that in the Western world, we are seeing emerging within the right a more extreme narrative that is designed to win the support of the quote-unquote losers of globalization. And in this situation, it is disturbing that the left seems unable to give another answer than just accusing the white working class, quote unquote, of being racist. Mm. From that perspective, Bernie seems like a sign of hope and the beginning of a perspective for a left that could unite the working class beyond all this identity politics. Clinton is definitely the neoliberal candidate. And I'm not sure what I'd say Trump is besides an utter sociopath, an opportunist who is all too readily prepared to curry favor with the most dangerous tendencies in American politics. I agree with your view. Reid goes on to, to the, whoever, who, whoever it was interview, uh, interviewing by, actually a man named Daniel, Daniel Zamora. I agree with your view of how Trump fits with the right-wing populist politics that's emerged in Europe as well as here. It's also important to recall, and this is important, it's also important to recall that the median income of a Trump voter last I saw, which was a couple of months ago, is over $77,000. That's not the working class. That's the small business or petty, petty professional types who are trying desperately to assert or maintain their sense of membership in the respectable strata. Those who see themselves as the re real Americans, quote unquote, identify with the wealthy and fear encroachment from the working class and especially the non-white elements of the working class. It's the same strat stratum of gentlemen of property and standing, quote unquote, that gave us anti-abolitionist anti mobs in the antebellum United States, the biggest and most politically powerful version of the Ku Klux Klan as a national phenomenon in the 1920s, the NSDAP, I'm not sure what that even is. So I'm socialist. See, Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the Nazis, basically. The Nazis, okay. Yeah, uh -huh. And all, yeah, no, well, I should know Nazis, right? Exactly. All, all <laughs> you other, should know from Nazis. I don't, right? I don't, just didn't associate NSDAP with Nazis. But anyway, and all other fascist and authoritarian movements. And, and then, just let me conclude these, with these couple paragraphs in answer to this question. I, uh, Adolf Reed says, I agree as well about the hope that Sanders' campaign that the Sanders campaign embodied, the campaign showed that it is possible to connect with the broad working class. And I have become increasingly conscious of the extent to which we, including leftists, permit the other side to define the boundaries of the working class for us. As Nelson Lichtenstein, a very well-known well labor historian, argues, reactionary labor law, or labor law reform after World War II, in particular the Taft-Hartley Act, which amended the New Deal era National Labor Relations Act that had spurred unionization since the 1930s, severely restricted the categories of workers eligible for unionization, managing to exclude many of the so-called white collar and functionary workers. I think we should begin to build on the more visionary aspects of the program, e.g., that is, uh, the, for example, the demand for free public higher education, <coughs> excuse me, 
decommodified health care, et cetera, and the vital fight to stop the TPP, and yes, of course, against the discrimination on the basis of race, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera, and also against neoliberal policing and the constantly expanding public-private carceral app apparatus, which we have to understand and insist that others also understand is a class issue. And so let me just include with a personal comment, because I think there's a lot of things, there's a lot of cross currents going on in how we look at Trump, how we look at Sanders, how we look at the labor movement, how we look at the, the you know, Demo, you know, Democratic Party. I'm glad, like Adolf Reed is, that Sanders run. I ran. I can't fault him for doing it within the, the you know, Democratic Party. It's passing strange that he was never a member of the Democratic Party, but joined the Democratic Party, in a sense, to run for, for, for president and then led people back into the fold two, two weeks ago at the, dem, dem, right. at, the, right. at, the na, at the national level, at the con, you know, convention. So these things are, are difficult to cope with, but the project for the left, I think Zadoff Reed says, and this is what I read, and in many other aspects uh, of, of, this, of, this, of, this, of this interview and, and other things that he writes, I, I think that the, the, the task for the, the left to be at the Green Party or any other party on the left or any other organizing movements on the left is to have to grapple with this, this difficult problem of identity politics, the problem of unionization of relatively conservative labor union leadership in the face of the need for a broader labor movement as part of a socialist movement, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, I know Jeffrey St. Clair has another scathing piece about Bernie today <laughs> on his website. I'm not, you know, I'm not personal about Bernie. He made a choice. People have to move on from that choice. It's too bad he couldn't move on with us. <laughs> um, apparently he's chosen, in a sense, not to move on exactly. with us. Exactly. Uh, I think that's fair. I think that's a fair, a fair assessment. And however one is critical of that, um, the question is how we deal with the, the Democratic Party at the, local le at the local and state levels also as, as we move forward. So um, that's a lot to put on the table, I know, but um, I, I, I want to correct him because, I want to correct him partly because about Sanders himself about whether Trump is a truly anti-neoliberal candidate in spite of what he says, whether he, uh, it, it, one thing that, that Reid does say is, uh, or I think he said in this interview, that one can't say that Hillary Clinton is the, is the lesser evil, but right. I, would, I don't want to f estimate, overestimate her as being the greater evil e either. Um, Trump is <laughs> Trump is a piece of work. Trump remains a piece of work. Okay, so I I don't I don't feel like uh, I obviously don't want to have any any truck with the general <laughs> the general approach to politics, whatever the hell that approach is that he is putting forward. I think uh, finally the interesting point uh, for politics in America in coming months and years is not so much the people themselves, Sanders, Clinton, uh, Trump, but the uh, groups that are behind them, uh, the groups that will end up voting for them, uh, the groups that they are, uh, uh, that see each one of those three and some others like Jules, uh, Jill Stein, for example, um, uh, as uh, speaking for them, and that's maybe what we should be talking about. Uh, I, I do think that uh, next week's poem uh, will be uh, a, uh, not a contemporary piece, but uh, a good deal older. Uh, I have an unfashionable taste for Robert Browning, uh, and Browning wrote a piece. Uh, One of the many things you have an unfashionable that's, taste well, for. Well, that's probably, probably, <laughs> they're probably connected at some level. Only my analyst knows for sure. Yeah. But the uh, uh, poem by Browning I have in mind is called The Lost Leader. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'll say something about its background next week. Just for a handful of silver he left us, just for a ribbon to pin on his coat. Uh, the opening. Uh, I think uh, I, I posted it the other day with reference to Sanders. So uh, we'll dispose of these various people uh, individually by uh, uh, poetic exclusion uh, as the weeks uh, ahead uh, give us a, a chance to do it. Uh, 
Ron, do you want to comment on what uh, David has said so far? You want to take, mm -hmm. or you want to start on uh, something well, else? Well, indirectly, yeah. Haven't we known other people who consider themselves on the left who decided to run as Democrats? Um, I'm sorry? From within the, well, you mean, I mean, Democratic, yeah. I mean, Bernie Sanders had always de identified as what, an independent social, the independent socialist right. party, mm -hmm. or just an independent candidate mm -hmm. yeah. in, you know, Vermont. And, um... I don't know how, how far back historically. I mean, people like William Jennings Bryan um, were in the, uh, were he was in the Populist Party, and the, oh, no, he was he was a Democrat, and right. and then and then the pop he sort of brought the Populist Party into the Democratic Party in the late 1800s. But all these other candidates that we've seen, Dennis Kucinich, Jesse Jackson, uh, most notably in the last 30 years or so, have been Democrats um, certainly. And, I mean, I think that's maybe, I mean, I wouldn't want to make, make, make too much of this. Bernie Sanders has always been, in, in, in effect, you know, a Democrat. He's always been a, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, but for all practical purposes. A fellow traveler. Demo, demo, <laughs> a Democrat, voted with him, caucused yes. with him, and so forth. And, you know, people can, you know, so, yeah. So, I mean, the, the question remains, whatever we say about Bernie Sanders, is whether the Democratic Party... I mean, how, how, many, how many events do we have to have that in which it shows that the Democratic Party will not allow itself to be taken over from the left, that the pro progressive Democrats, the P, you know, PDA, which still, you know, chugs heroically forward, um, what, is their, what is their prospect within the, the Democratic Party? Um, it seems like the institute, and I think Reid mentions this at some point, that the institutional structure, including the primary primary election structure, it makes it impossible or nearly impossible. I guess nothing is impossible. Uh, and then there's a lot, and then Ed, Adolf Reed had a lot to be said about Hillary's genuine relationships with black elites and the black voters in this country, uh, regardless of whatever criticism of Bernie you might have of, of that. Uh, there's that that's that's an, a solid and somewhat understandable you know, you know, in, you know, in relation to the legacy of the, the civil rights movement. You this, keep that, invoking something called the left, uh, with a capital L, apparently. How do we tell whether someone is on the left or a member of the left? Well, I would, I would say, <laughs> I would say how they that, feel about capitalism. Yeah, that being I mean, I would answer? say that. Yeah, I think more and more we just have to come to the idea that you know, democracy and capitalism are ideas that are fundamentally opposed to each other, and that. Um, that's coming out in the way neoliberal capitalism has evolved in this country. And there was that period after World War II when it seems like the capitalists could play nice with the working class. And there's a lot of se serious analysis now of how that went and how that's broken down. But clearly the capitalist class only put up with, with that as long as their power wasn't being threatened. And as soon as it was threatened, in the 1960s, they cracked down pretty hard on the working class and basically destroyed the labor movement in this country. So, to answer, not to evade your, your question, but the, the left sees an alternative to capitalism to the Democratic Party as a capitalist party, has strong views about public, public provision of, of, of essential, um, essential things like education and health care and housing, and, and is and fundamentally anti-war, fundamentally anti-American anti imperialism. And yes, that's the left to me, and of course it's complicated, but it's not, it, liberalism has its place, but what liberalism has become is you know, not, doesn't work for me anymore. I, I think there is a, 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 a deeper difference here, though, that needs to be uh, talked about and that has emerged in various ways in British and American politics uh, in the last year or two. Uh, in some ways, it's clearer in British politics, although the similarities are great, in that uh, the emergence of Corbyn uh, as the head of the Labour Party uh, represents what Bernie Sanders should have been. Uh, he represents a left 
over against a liberal party, and I'm using the American terms here because they do change a bit uh, as you move across the Atlantic, but uh, we have for a long time rather casually talked of the liberal of liberals and the left uh, as if it were a continuum. You go for you go in you you, you yeah. go towards the left and you run into liberals and the, you know the more liberal they become the more left more sort often of you can use the term but left not quantitative yeah. not qualitative. And the fact of the matter is, there's a fundamental distinction between liberal and left that shows up in the difference between Blairites and Cor uh, Corbynistas uh, in Britain right now, and that uh, uh, represents in some sense the line that um, uh, uh, Sanders was playing across. Sanders presented himself as a leftist, that is a critic of capitalism, uh, over against Clinton's liberalism. Uh, which was not, which is not critical of capitalism at all. Rather, it's sponsored by it. Uh, he presented that, and then when uh, the uh, uh, when push came to shove, he backed off. He flipped back and said, "Well, okay, ignore everything I've said so far. I'm going to support Clinton, and you should too." Now, that's the great refusal that uh, uh, Jeffrey Sinclair at Counterpunch has been. Uh, uh, has excoriated, and I think he's quite right to do it. I think Sanders' uh, uh, backsliding, uh, it's more than backsliding, it was a backward leap, uh, is a very serious betrayal. And what it is, uh, the betrayal makes sense only if we understand a distinction between liberalism, that is, uh, trying to ameliorate the harsh edges of capitalism, and the left, which means, in fact, a challenge to capitalism. Uh, and uh, the uh, history that uh, David just referred to, the history of the uh, uh, development of American capitalism uh, in sort of two great steps after the Second World War, uh, one liberal step uh, into the 1970s where those edges were trying to, uh, to, 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 trying to be taken off capitalism, and then the counterattack of capitalism, my metaphor is getting a bit out of hand, I think. The capitalism, the <laughs> counterattack of capitalism that we call neoliberalism, uh, that has succeeded so well in the last generation. Uh, and uh, unless we make that distinction between liberal and left and see how Sanders was playing back and forth across it, uh, I don't think we can really understand what's going on in American politics and why. Uh, the uh, Clinton administration to come uh, will be simply a continuation of the Bush and uh, uh, Obama administrations, uh, that is, uh, minions of the 1% uh, protecting uh, the neoliberal policies uh, that have been common for American presidents for 40 years. Uh, it, looked like, it looked like Sanders was opposing that. He wasn't. Have there been any capitalist critis, critics of capitalism? Have there, uh, uh, yes, there have been critics of capitalism. Other than us, you mean? Any yes. capitalist. A capitalist is ambiguous, whether it's someone who has a lot of money to invest or someone who believes in the uh, basic uh, imperatives worldview. Of, uh, yeah, capitalism. I'm using it in well, the second Kane, sense. Kane, yeah. Keynes was a capitalist critic yes, of capitalism. Yes. He's a capitalist in both senses, yes, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, you might you might not even call him a critic critic of capitalism. I mean, he was he was trying to figure out a way capitalism could not be as vicious a system <laughs> as as it has periodically turned out to be. Yeah. Paul Krugman, on the other hand, is probably a capitalist in both senses. He's not worried where his next meal is coming from, mm -hmm. no. and uh, you know, uh, also is a defender of uh, capitalism, as we have seen. Uh, so yes. Uh, well, this raises a question for me about where do you begin socio-political analysis? And uh, there are several models uh, that are possible. Uh, one is a uh, class analysis, but then you have to start describing the classes that you're talking about that may be in conflict. And uh, uh, how many classes are there, and how do we know where the boundaries are, and who's a member of each class? And this turns out to be uh, <laughs> possibly 
uh, difficult exercise, it seems to me. Well, actually, but, it's not. I, I mean, see. It's, okay, thank you. Carl. Since the early part of the twentieth, uh, early part of the nineteenth century, we've talked about the working class as a class which is the dissolution of all other classes. The working class, working class, uh, refers to those people uh, who have to, who has to who have to sell what makes them most human. Uh, their work of head and hands to somebody else in order to eat, in order to eat regularly. Do those include the CEOs of the big corporations? Probably not. Uh, they don't have to do that. But uh, it, it is a larger group than we normally think. We think of the working class as being a few along the bottom of society. In fact, working class, by any consistent definition, is going to include most of society because most of us aren't capitalists in the sense that in the second sense that you use, that is someone who can dispose of a good deal of capital. Uh, capitalist in the sense of someone who believes in the principles of capitalism uh, is a different matter. Yeah. Um, uh, what about uh, all the people who are or aspire to be uh, rentiers uh, who want to live on the income of, uh, from their investments? Are they that capitalists? Once again, it depends upon whether they have enough capital to do that or whether they, they uh, your two definitions apply. Do they believe in that system and support it? Uh, or are they in fact able to exploit uh, the working class yeah, I think as true capitalists really do? Most of them don't really know what they believe. Big but, one? Uh, most of them don't really know what they believe. One of the insights of... But this is an important, this is an important point. Psychology is that people, uh, contrary to Cartesianism, don't really know the contents of their own minds. They don't know uh, their own motives and uh, intentions in uh, doing things for the most part. And uh, when challenged to tell us about that, they'll, they'll start stammering. This is a fundamental difference between class politics and identity politics. Class politics looks at the relationships and groups in society based upon their class position. Identity politics looks upon the relationships of people to society as a whole on their, on their identification. That is subjective. That is what they think. A class position is objective. It depends upon how you live, and you are a member of that class or not, as you, whether you know it or not. Uh, whereas uh, all the identities that are being manipulated by an anti-capitalist uh, politics, uh, sorry, uh, an anti-left politics, uh, are identities that are a matter of people stepping forward and identifying themselves as this, that, or the other. Uh, so the uh, subjective versus the objective identification of a class position uh, is crucial to the distinction between identity politics and class politics. That's wonderful. Well, I would, How many classes are there? Well, uh, you can just, uh, if, if you define class as the role in the process of production, uh, you can give, begin to talking about varieties of those roles. Actually, if you want to be, uh, uh, well, uh, it's a matter of uh, trying to say what roles are being uh, filled in, fulfilled in the society and how they work one with another. Uh, that changes over time. I mean, the capitalism that exists in early 21st century America is very different from the capitalism that existed uh, in Marx's time uh, because those roles change, because the class composition uh, is... Uh, various. It, it changes over time. That's fine. Well, but once I, again, but, how many classes are there? But, it, you know, well, for, you know, for instance, it op I mean, you can say that there's two, three, five, or ten, and, and it does have something to do with how people relate to each other in terms of either owning the means, means, of, means of production or being identified with the ownership of the mean, means of production. So, therefore, we have this managerial class that was assumed in the years after World War II to sort of be mediating between the working class and the unions and, and the, you know, the ownership class. And they had their loyalties to both. They had their loyalties to a system in which workers, unionized workers, were being treated fairly well. But what's important to note is that what happened in the early 1970s was when there was a, a broad rebellion going on and when there was a profit squeeze, for many reasons, including the war in Vietnam, you had an ownership class. And not just the owners themselves, but the spokespeople for these owners, the people identified with those 
who said, we need to put a stop to this. And that's where you get the famous Powell memo in 1971 to the Ch Chamber of Commerce. You have a class that does, in a sense, very self-consciously think of itself as a class, whether it, it involves Wall Street, the mil military industrial complex, um, or, C or corporate boardrooms. Um, you, you, have a, you have a group of people who are able to really uh, to put their foot down, to assert themselves a as a, a class and really push back. When there was, there was cross-currents of how to deal with this crisis, especially under, under Nixon, um, there, there were people that were looking for ways to court, sort of carry on this, this ma managerial agreement with unions and so forth to maintain a fairly, a fairly prosperous working class. But at some point, um, given, I mean, it's a complex historical drama, but at some point people said, no, we, we have to destroy the working class. And that's what they've basically done for the last 40 years. They've destroyed unions and they didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't by, by you know, accident that that happened. It wasn't by accident that we have all this precarious work going on, that people no longer have benefits, that, no, that people no longer expect to have benefits. What do you call these people other than the working class? And, and how, can these people, how can these people have faith in a system that has betrayed them at such a fundamental level, um, that puts them in, that, that uses their debt to talk of, talk of renter, talk of the people who profit from other people's debt, talk of the bankers. And yes, it is complex because we're all in pension funds. We're all in, I mean, not all of us, but many people are in pension funds. So we care, we want, we want the price of stock, of stock to go up. We own stock. I personally don't, but many people like, like me, and I certainly have in the, the past. So, you know, so it, it, it is complicated. Neoliberal capitalism and the class, cross currents of class, but it's clear what the interests of a certain group of people are in maintaining the system, and it's clear what the interest of a certain group of people should be, however they understand the system, of really fundamentally changing the system. In retirement, are you getting the benefits of an annuity, and where do you think Absolutely. they're invested? Absolutely. Pardon? Where do you think they're invested? They're, well, they're, they're conservatively investing in a broad range of things, and... Um, no, I mean guilty as charged. We're all we're all we're all we're all uh, complicit right. in this financialized system. But that the fact that that we've all been drawn into this financialized debt-driven system doesn't mean we're all of the same class. We look at that system from very diff different points of view. We be we benefit and control that system in very in very different ways. And it's clear that when the you had the mortgage crisis in 2008. The banks got bailed out, but the homeowners didn't. The homeowners had been given these toxic mortgages, lost their homes. So does that make them not part of the working class because they borrowed money to buy, to buy a home? Uh, well, we just heard that the uh, differences are uh, uh, sharp and objectively uh, definable. So, uh, well, how, how, uh, does, how, how, how does we, how people view themselves or what they think okay. enter into that? But do 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 you really do you really not because see. they can be misled and deluded about their class position, right? Yeah, they can I, misunderstand it. I mean, this is the issue that's taken up by Glenn Ford in talking about why uh, so many working class blacks supported Clinton uh, rather than Sanders in the primaries when, uh, objectively speaking, their interests as members of the working class were on Sanders' side, or if they believed Sanders, and in those days people did. Uh, so uh, uh, his answer to that uh, is, is very interesting. He said the experience, he said there are really two factors that accounts for it. One is black misleadership. Uh, that we have constructed from, out of the civil rights movement a black leadership in this country that is complicit with its oppressors, that's fallen in with the, uh, uh, the, the liberal control of American politics uh, that has been uh, the temptation uh, for political movements uh, like the union movement, uh, the populist movement and so forth for generations. So there's a different point, uh, according to Glenn Ford, 
regarding uh, uh, black people in America and the uh, and liberal politics, and that is that the experience of most adult blacks in this country is an experience of the Republican Party as the white man's party, uh, as the party which has excluded them from everything from the polls to schools to uh, the uh, benefits such as they were uh, of uh, the American middle class. The hostility, uh, the very reasonable doubt about the good faith of the white man's party leads uh, most American blacks to identify with the Democratic Party uh, uh, at the outset. So argues Glenn Ford. Um, the great task of independent black politics, says Ford, is to pry black folks loose from the Democratic Party's lethal embrace. And for that, he says, we, meet, we need a movement in the streets. That is, political movements, uh, electoral movements, are not enough. Uh, the uh, uh, argument seems to me to be uh, uh, certainly on the right lines there. Okay, so what we need is uh, more uh, street demonstrations marching on the streets and uh, uh, barricades, bonfires, and uh, blood in the streets. Is that what he's advocating? I think maybe it would be a good idea to look at ways in which uh, political uh, views can be made known uh, outside of a controlled election. Uh, not that the election should be ignored, but um, all the major changes in American politics in our lifetime, surely, uh, the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movements, didn't come through ballot boxes. Ballot boxes uh, uh, finally uh, recognized the changes that had taken place, but the changes came because of public demonstrations. Uh, and that's uh, been true from uh, uh, Martin Luther King to Abby Hoffman. Uh, seems to me that's right. You're, wa you're watching news from Neptune. This raises for me, oh, I'm sorry, the question of uh, what is the most fruitful kind of socioeconomic political analysis? Uh, is it this uh, class business, which I've been raising some uh, questions about, or is it uh, interest group or uh, identity group and so on? So what we're stuck with for the present is, among people who think that they are uh, liberals and so on is the identity group stuff, which has been coming on to us for about a century now, uh, at least since the uh, uh, notion took hold that uh, the proper governance of society was among competing interest groups who were each uh, vying for, they were all vying for power and uh, setting limitations on each other. And uh, that's how uh, the interest group uh, idea got played out in uh, recent uh, liberalism. But um, uh, which is really the more fruitful? It seems to me in the short run that there's a lot to be said for the uh, identity group uh, approach. And in the longer run, uh, I suspect that there's a good deal uh, more wisdom in uh, the Marxist approach of looking at competing social classes. And the fundamental dynamic is uh, probably with the latter historically. But uh, uh, in the short run, we have to deal with this question of why so many uh, Trump voters, apparently, appear to this small and shrinking to support this small uh, group of small, small and shrinking group appears to uh, support uh, Trump and so on, of white, aging, southern, uh, largely uneducated uh, males and why they are, uh, with some social research now is showing to be highly authoritarian in their outlook, why they are identifying so much uh, as uh, you know, supporters of Trump. Well, I think you, you cooked the question by assuming that that's, the, that's Trump's support. I don't think it is. Okay. And uh, okay. speaking as a white, aging Southern male, uh, obviously miseducated in some ways, but that's another story, uh, I w s simply say that the the thing that has scared the political establishment so remarkably about the Trump phenomenon uh, is that it's out of hand. It's not in control. Uh, and the, uh, the extent to which 
it has challenged uh, the political establishment that puts forward uh, uh, candidates, neoliberal and neoconservative candidates, uh, all neoliberal and neoconservative candidates each year, uh, is extremely important. Uh, and that uh, the attraction of Trump comes less from the uh, bloviating personality than it does from the fact that he's saying things that uh, most Americans haven't heard from a politician for a long time. I, yeah, I, I think Trump does attract um, probably among his more affluent supporters just as much as less affluent. He does attract some he does appeal to a racist personality. He does appeal to the limits of, of what one can say and do uh, in, in terms of blaming, uh, blaming certain kinds of, blaming certain problems on certain groups of people. He, he kind of exposes what, what, is, what, is always, what is always there, the sort of simplistic, a simplistic understanding of what the problem is. That appeals not just to some stereotype of uh, trailer trailer park trash or something, what white trash or angry white men. I mean, I'm tired of these stereotypes. He appeals to, as as Adolf Reed was saying here, with a median income of seventy seven thousand dollars. He's appealing to people who are not as who are not as um, precarious. As many, but he's also pe appealing to some other groups of people who are hurting, and they may yes, have exactly. ideas in their head that that I would, wouldn't agree with. But the the attraction is there because he's he's putting something out there that um, is not acceptable in American political discourse. Exactly, it's 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 um, it's clumsy, and it's and it's ignorant in lots of ways. But he's kind of putting it out there. He's touching a nerve in yes. this group of people that deserves to be called something other than ang than angry white males or or racist white males. Mm. And Should we call so, them uh, <laughs> Second Amendment people? Or? Well, you know, you, yeah, you could stereotype them in all kinds of way, but ways. But they're basically people without who don't feel secure in their jobs and their lives. I think well, I, one way to get at the appeal of Trump. Uh, is to see to look at the people who hate him. Uh, what uh, within the political establishment? And I must admit, we should start there. I mean, we've mentioned the the, the Gillens and Page study frequently that shows that 80 percent of Americans really have no purchase whatsoever on American political decisions. It's really only the upper 20 percent, the political class, so to speak. Actually, they, they do it but, 70 and 30, but I don't want to <laughs> quibble with that. I don't want to quibble. Okay. <laughs> Even what's, though I will. What's 10 percent among friends? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 70 and 30. Yeah. Uh, I'm the, uh, the there's an 80 20 rule in business that yeah, tends to yeah. look like uh, yeah. what they what they found in terms of politics. So yeah. we'll leave that to the sociologists who can uh, debate the numbers. But given a split along that line, that suggests that only a fraction, a smaller fraction, as a matter of fact, the smaller fraction of the American uh, populace really is politically important. Now. Who among that group, who within that group, have been most upset by Trump? Uh, the, uh, those who depend upon the military-industrial complex, the depends upon the permanent war, uh, the, those who depend upon American foreign policy are the ones who are most concerned about Trump. He's upsetting the apple, apple cart an apple cart that both sides, Republicans and Democrats, have contributed to for generations. And that's what upsets uh, the New York Times editorial writers. Uh, that's what upsets the neocons. That's what's sending the neocons out of the Republican Party and to Mrs. Clinton from the beginning. Uh, the real issue is foreign policy, which means the real issue is war. Uh, Trump is dangerous because he has uttered absolute heresy regarding America's war making. Uh, where America has, for since the end of the Second World War, substituted the control of the uh, military control for the economic dominance that it had at the end of that war. And that's the major geopolitical issue today. Uh, Trump is violating the principles agreed by all parties 
of American war making. Uh, for example, Russia is evil, uh, NATO defends freedom. Uh, he says this is not true. Uh, and we should uh, we should reorganize things so that uh, that's uh, that becomes uh, that becomes obvious. That's the thing. That's the thing that upsets the establishment. Well, uh, thank you for telling us again what the real issue is, Carl. I think that is the real issue. I Do you, you disagree that it's the real issue? I, I think there is no real issue. Ah, uh, but an I... issue is whatever anyone thinks it is. I see. And, uh, uh, those are all over the all over the map. Sounds like that's, radical su su subjectivity. No, yeah, no. that's right. <laughs> no, no. That's 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 not the way they see it in the editorial board of the New York Times, and uh, the uh, way in which the uh, uh, American politics are breaking down are uh, is much more along uh, but, foreign policy what, lines what, what than domestic policy saying, lines. But what, you know, even though I'm I'm willing to concede that. Even though I don't buy into the anti-neoliberal aspects of Trump, the anti-neoconservative -neo aspects is more con you know, you know, convincing in the specific case of Russia and NATO and so forth. Exactly. But I think the next three months is going to be what we're going to be seeing is, is Trump Trump's advisors if they if he does <laughs> if if they can get him in a room and and convince this this man to do what they say. He will be cozying up to some aspects of the American establishment, including foreign policy, and he will, you know, when the poll numbers are are really dipping, and they probably will be, that he will be beginning to say some things that make him s sound somewhat more like Hillary Clinton. I'll be glad to admit I'm wrong. Of course, I don't like to predict things, but it seems like it's in a, it's in a, it's in. That's the way it's going to be going, to to keep it. If if otherwise, this. The polls aren't going to be, are, are going to be showing that this isn't this isn't going to, going to, going to even be close. I think this is, the crucial, this is the crucial if, issue, though, because in the in the light, light of the diplomatic revolution uh, around Turkey, uh, the Obama administration's uh, uh, foreign policy uh, is falling apart. Uh, Clinton is the uh, savior of the. Uh, consistent American foreign policy over a generation, uh, and she is confronting uh, a non-static situation. Uh, we're not talking about that, but I think that will have a great deal to do with how the discussion uh, develops uh, in the next weeks. Hasn't uh, Trump already announced that if he loses, uh, it will be because the election is rigged? Uh, do you think there's uh, any chance that that's true? We don't know. It hasn't uh, happened yet. So we don't know. It hasn't happened yet. That's quite right. Uh, so maybe it's more important to s talk about why Trump has the following he does and what he's actually saying, what he actually proposes. We have a race between two principal candidates, one of whom will clearly produce more, uh, uh, more war, a continuous war with the Bush-Obama wars, and one who's criticized them. How can that be a difficult choice? Well, I don't think that's clear at all. Well, of course, it's clear. What has Trump said? To argue with certain people about certain things, I know that. So I don't want to waste any more time on it. Okay. Do you do you think there's any difference between what Clinton and Trump have said about Russia or NATO? Uh, I don't know. Uh, there are certainly there are differences. Where have you been? <laughs> Under a rock somewhere. Uh -huh. Apparently, but. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, what what accounts for this? Um, Why do you think the Newlands have have deserted the Republican Party and gone over to Clinton? I don't know. Ask them. Well, they've said <laughs> they they've been quite candid about it. They say Trump is not willing to continue the war policy of recent administrations you that everyone that. agrees on. You don't know that. What he well, has said, Ron, has that so is what that is what Nolan. That's that's what they have said. That Trump is abandoning the uh, positions regarding Ru the major enemy, the existential enemy, Russia, and the position regarding the defense of freedom, that is NATO, that has sustained American freedom for a generation. Okay, I can't take take seriously anything that Trump says because he'll say the opposite uh, the next day or the next week, or he, he will say it. Well, it was a joke, or it was. Uh, Sarcasm, or uh, whatever. I, and, uh, I would. I mean, that's I would. Nonsense. I would, be, I would be skeptical to the point that I doubt that a President Trump will be able to challenge 
the basic neoconservative premises of the American foreign policy. I doubt that he, he would be able to do that or would even want to do it. And I agree, Ron, that you don't know what this man, what goes on in this man's head. And you don't, you don't, you know, he, he is saying these things and he has certain instinct for saying them, but they're not, they're not principled statements. They're, they're statements, they're certain political instincts about what, how he likes to make deals and who he wants to, wants to talk to. But that doesn't mean that he's any worse you know, if he's not any really any better than Hillary Clinton, it certainly doesn't mean that he, that he's any worse. And it does mean something that when you refer to the, the the Newlands, you should. I mean, not to be sexist about it, it's the Kagan Newlands. It's the yeah. the Robert Kagan and his wife. Oh, the Newlands, yes, I'm you know, sorry. Victoria <laughs> Newland and his her, and her husband right. Robert Kagan. Kagan is more well known in terms of his writing and so forth. That's you know, true. But, but she's more well known in terms of being a p political opter operative, which she probably would have uh, come out with a high place in. The Clinton, Clinton the, she will almost certainly be the next secretary of something or other, or and she or, has a high place in the and, current administration and, 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 too. Yeah, so, right. Yeah, so yeah. and so, you know, I mean, and even William Crystal has gone over, I think, to the to the, the Clinton side because he wants he wants a ground war. I mean, William Crystal wants a ground war in Ukraine. Yeah, <laughs> and yep. you know, um, it's just. To, it's what our to, friend used to call bloody Bill Crystal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, the Crystal legacy goes on in, in even maybe somewhat nastier ways. But so again, they all have bloody dreams. You know, I didn't. I mean, I don't raise these issues to. I mean, the difference, Carl, I have with you is that I, I don't, I don't trust Donald Trump to be <laughs> saying what he really thinks. And I, I, I don't trust Donald my Trump argument doesn't be, depend be, on that to be well no but and I don't I don't trust that he's really any different in terms of what he would do but um, the Newlands think he is yeah yeah but <laughs> um, but still it's you know it's interesting that he's able to attract the support that he, he has he has attracted by saying some of the things he does and um, it shows it shows dissension within the the not just the ranks to the left but quote unquote to to the right i don't think anything he says has much to do with uh, his uh, support uh, so it would be difficult to uh, uh, maintain that so why, I think why, his, why aren't the kagan supporting him his support depends upon a lot of other factors that uh, political psychologists kagan? have started to uh, i don't know why kagan and you don't, and Victoria Newland support him, and uh, you don't either. They've, they've said, <laughs> they've said he's unwilling to get his war on. Okay, that's the, uh, that's the danger he represents to the American establishment. What Trump represents and his uh, support, I think, is this uh, rising level of uh, resentment and uh, denial and defiance uh, among uh, the uh, uh, lower working class in American society. Don't they have reason for that? Uh, yes, they okay. have some reason. Good. They, as they've always had. But uh, Well, but, but things have changed do, in the last few years, right? Where do we get the most fruitful analysis of what's going on and enable us to understand these uh, social forces and how they may play out? And uh, is it uh, class analysis? Uh, we're unable to say how many classes there are, or what are the characteristics that put, puts a person in uh, one class than another in any uh, clear and definite way. But, or is it this uh, uh, interest group analysis or the uh, uh, identity group analysis? And in the short run, there's a lot to be said for the uh, identity group analysis, it seems to me. But uh, looking deeper into the psychological research of uh, authoritarianism, uh, alienation, resentment, and uh, uh, the uh, people's visions of uh, what I would call masculinity, strength and power and toughness that uh, are really out there and seem to be bugging a whole lot of people. But the point is that the people who are being bugged, that 70% of the population that we've been talking about, have seen their life circumstances constrained and their prospects delimited over the last generation in a way they never have been before. And it's that resentment that is coming to the fore here. It often takes various forms depending upon whether the reason for their 
dispossession has been identified very well or not, whether it's black people that's doing it to them or immigrants or something of that sort, but a more accurate description leads to a, 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 a real account of why so many Americans are looking for a, 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 a competitive politics. Okay. And, and it may make a difference. You've been That's watching fine. News from Neptune for the 32nd week of 2016, a participation edition. I'm Carl Osterberg. My discussants tonight have been David Green and Ron Zoak. Our thanks to our directors and producers, Jason Liggett and Yosef Cash. Inshallah, we'll be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune. To remind you in the words of Edward de Vere, what's past is prologue, what to come, in yours and my discharge. In the meantime, confusion to our enemies, and a good night to you.